Let's pray together and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, your word is living and active, and it's sharper than a double-edged sword, and it's able to pierce our thoughts and tensions, even divide us down to the soul. And we ask that you would do that this morning. Speak the words we need to hear. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the living word made flesh. Amen. Today is Palm Sunday. Doesn't feel like it or look like it, but it is. And tomorrow, of course, marks the beginning of what Christians have referred to as Passion Week or Holy Week, the most significant week in the Christian year, certainly the most significant week in the life of Jesus Christ when he was on earth. It's the four Gospels emphasize the importance of this week in their content alone. You may not know this, but two-fifths of Matthew's Gospel deals with the events of the last week of Jesus' life. Three-fifths of Mark's Gospel deals with that last week. One third of Luke, which we'll look at in a few moments, deals with that last week, and almost half of the Gospel of John deals with the events of the last week. I wanna encourage you this week, if you're new to this or even if you're not, to set aside some time this week to read the accounts of the last week of Jesus' life, to reflect on them, to pray. Maybe you've gotten out of the habit of Bible reading or maybe you're new to it. This is the perfect week for you to refocus your heart or to begin. In fact, if you have the Chapel Street Church app, and even if you don't, we're going to be sending out via the app and online uh, a weekly devotional, daily devotional for every day of the week, focusing on what took place that day in the last week of Jesus' life. We can encourage you to follow along with us as we reflect it and think about it. But on this day, we call it the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, because they waved palm branches as Jesus rode into the holy city. Let's open to Luke chapter 19. Each of the gospel writers gives an account of the triumphal entry. We're going to look at Luke's primarily. I'll read verses 28 through 42. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, and as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near, he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Each of the four gospel writers, as I said, gives an account of the triumphal entry. John, John chapter 12, says it very interesting, in a very interesting way. John says that six days before the Passover, so that would have been yesterday, Saturday, Jesus stops in the town of Bethany. Now, Bethany is the same town where he raised Lazarus from the dead. Some of you might remember this story. It's in John 11, the chapter before. And Lazarus is there because he's been raised from the dead. And he has two sisters, Mary and Martha. And they throw Jesus a dinner party before he heads into Jerusalem on Sunday. Maybe you don't know this part of the story. Because in every culture, if somebody raises you from the dead, you owe them a dinner party. It's just common courtesy. I mean, it's the least you can do, right? I mean... After all you've done for me, it's the nicest thing anyone's ever done. Raised the dead, I want to throw you a party. Jesus stops there and has a dinner with his friend Lazarus, Mary and Martha, friends in that village. And the next day, he makes his way to Jerusalem. Now I want you to see, if you've never paid attention to this before, that everything Jesus does this week, this day, starting this day Sunday, and every day following is 100% preordained. He's thought it out. It's very intentional and calculated. He's planned it all ahead of time. He's timed his arrival in the great city with the beginning of Passover week. This is the greatest week 
in the Jewish year. Jerusalem swelled from most scholars say somewhere between 50 and 75,000 people living in there in the day of Jesus on, on average to well over twice that. Some estimate over 250,000. So it just exploded in terms of its population. Jews from all over the area would descend on the city, so many that they couldn't all fit in the city, so they would be sleeping, camping, making tents and huts, and uh, and sleeping under trees in the surrounding hillsides. That's why their crowds are gathering before he even enters the city, because they're already there, getting ready for Passover week. And you see that Jesus prearranges everything right down to the cult of a donkey. Where to find it? It's going to be tied up. And untie it, bring it to me, he says. He even gives them the specific password. If somebody asks you what you're doing, why are you taking this colt, tell them the Lord needs it. I like that so matter of fact. So they untie the colt, they're taking it, and people, people not surprisingly said, hey, where are you going with that? The Lord needs it. Like a Jedi mind trick. Okay, I guess the Lord needs it. Take the donkey, right? They go. He's thought it all out ahead of time. Now, I want you to see a picture here. This is a picture I took when we were in Israel. This is looking at Jerusalem standing on the Mount of Olives. You hear mountain, you think mountain. It's not like that. It's like Johnson's Mound, maybe a little bit bigger. It's a hill, a large hillside, covered with olive groves. In fact, at the base of this hill, before the Kidron Valley, this, saw, this is standing on the Mount of Olives, looking across the Kidron Valley to Jerusalem. At the base of the hill is where the Garden of Gethsemane was. It means Gethsemane, it comes from the Hebrew word meaning oil or olive oil press. Anyway, so go back, sorry. Back one, there you go. You see that castle looking wall there? That is the wall of the old city Jerusalem and the large dome of the rock, which is likely where the temple in Jesus' day would have been standing. That's on what's called the Temple Mount, the raised platform in Herod's day. That was destroyed in AD 70. So everything you're looking at there is, doesn't date back to the time of Jesus because it was all destroyed in 70 AD. But it, there, it, there are various rebuildings that happened throughout the, history, the centuries since. Now flip the next one. This is looking from Jerusalem at the Mount of Olives. So you're looking at the hill where I was standing a moment ago. That little chapel at the bottom there with the three arches, that's near the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus is very close to the city. He can see the holy city. He can see the temple. He pauses there. Everything's in view. And he tells two disciples, go on ahead. It's all prepared. And they do. And he waits for them to bring the colt to him. I just want you to get a picture of what's happening here. To bring the colt to him. Why? He's going to ride in. This also is intentional. He's not going to walk in. He's been to Jerusalem many times before. There's no record of him ever riding in. He's going to walk, he walked in before, but now he's riding in through the main gate, right to the temple. I want you to see here that he is a paradoxical king. He is taking the same route as King David in 2 Samuel 19 and Solomon, David's son, when they rode into the city. Now, in the ancient world, this is the way kings and conquering military heroes entered the city, either the city they had just conquered or returning to the capital city after they had achieved a great victory. They were riding most often riding a war horse. So he's riding in as a king, but he's not riding on a great war horse. He will, in in Luke 19, or in Revelation 19, excuse me, we find out that he's going to someday return on a great white horse with eyes blazing like fire and a sword in his mouth. That my son Benjamin refers to Air Horse One when Jesus comes back. (laughs) I think that's funny. But here he's riding on the colt of a donkey. Luke 19, verse 11, we won't be on the screen, but it tells us this. It says that they were, he, Jesus proceeded to tell them everything in parables because the, everyone was excited, thinking the kingdom of God was about to come immediately. Immediately. The whole town is buzzing. The whole city is a buzz. Those that live there, those that are visiting. They all expect something big to happen. Now contrast this with Jesus, how he usually behaved when people called him the Messiah. Numerous times when he healed people, he says, don't tell anyone about this. Keep this to yourselves. Don't tweet it. Don't post it on Instagram. I don't want a big thing happening. I don't want this to go viral just yet. It's not my time. He tells his own disciples not to tell anybody. He warns them, specifically in Matthew and Mark, not to tell anybody that he is the Christ, the Messiah. But here... He's being overt. 
He's intentionally writing in on the beginning of the most important week in the history of, of the Jewish people as a king, allowing them to praise him and call him king. Now, he's riding in on a donkey. I mean, if he had come as a conquering military hero, he comes in on a war horse with legions of angels, and he goes right to the fortress of Antonia, where the Roman garrison was stationed, and he wipes them out. That's not what he does. We'll get to that in a minute. Luke 19, verses 37 and 38, let me read them for you again. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, Israel already has a king, Herod. And he's a puppet king under the true king of the area of the region, Caesar. This is seditious language. This is dangerous stuff Jesus is doing here. And he's doing it intentionally. He's forcing the issue of his identity. He's also fulfilling prophecy. Look at Zechariah 9. Verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Another strange thing Jesus does at this moment is that he allows people to publicly praise and identify him as Messiah. He doesn't hush anybody up. The word Hosanna, we always say that. We have the kids say it, right? Do you know what the word Hosanna, Hoshana, you know what it means? We, we use it, Hosanna in the highest, but actually the Hebrew root for Hosanna means save now. Save now. Both a declaration, God's salvation is now, and a request. Save now. Please save now. Do you remember what the people were thinking in, in Luke 19, 11? That the kingdom of God is going to come immediately. So what, what's happening here? They all think it's now. Now is the time. He's writing in, the disciples think, finally, heads are going to roll. This is going to be good. This is, he's finally going to do it. Knock out the Romans. Just throw out the evildoers. Reestablish David's throne. We're going to be, we're going to rule. We're going to reign. It's happening now. And the people are chanting that thing. And Jesus lets them do it. The Pharisees try to get Jesus to get his disciples to be quiet, don't they? But he refuses. He's not sneaking in this time. He's not walking in through a side gate. He's riding in down the main street. And the final paradoxical thing I want you to see here before we move on is that he weeps. Jesus weeps. Look at verse 41 through 44. I'll read them. It won't be on the screen. I'll read them for you. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace but now they're hidden from your eyes. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. What, think about this for a minute. He's riding in hundreds and hundreds of people shouting and praising, behold the king, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, save now, now it's happening, cheering, throwing down their cloaks, waving palm branches, this is, it's an epic scene. And Jesus weeps, now the Greek word used for weep there is, there's two different words used in the New Testament for, for weeping, one is the word used in John 11 when he weeps over Lazarus' death, it just means shedding silent tears, they saw his tears, but this word, this Greek word is different. It's the word that means loud wailing, like mo great audible mourning. So think about this for a minute. He's riding in as the king. People are praising him, and he's sobbing and wailing when he sees Jerusalem. What a paradox. We don't often think about that. You think about it, you're probably going, that's right, I'm the king, or maybe just sitting there like Jesus with kind of a dazed look in his eyes from all the goofy movies we've seen as kids, right? He's riding down the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley up into the city, and as he approaches the city, he begins to weep and sob so loud that it's heard over the shouts of the crowds. Why is he weeping? He's weeping because he knows those who cry, save now, on Sunday, will cry, crucify him, on Friday. 
He's weeping because he knows the coming destruction of the temple. Remember, his, he's giving a word of prophecy here. He says, the day is coming when this is all going to be torn down. This temple is going to be destroyed. You're going to be destroyed. In fact, it's tight, Emperor, uh, Emperor Vespasian would send his son Titus to the city to wipe it out in 70 AD. I've been to Masada, which is the last holdout of the Jewish people, where there were, a thousand were slaughtered. Josephus tells us that rivers of blood ran through the city when this happened, just, seven, just, just less than 40 years from the time Jesus is writing in. He's saying this is going to happen. He's weeping because of what's coming. He's also weeping because he says, would that you have known the things that have been prepared for your peace. Did you catch that? What's he saying? You don't get it, he's saying. I'm a king, not like you think. You know, there's a place in, in Mark's gospel where Jesus predicts his death. He did this frequently. And Peter pulls him aside when Jesus says, the son of man must be betrayed and then suffer many things and then die. And Peter pulls him aside and says, Jesus, stop talking that way. It's bad for morale. <laughs> he doesn't, that's my translation, right? He just says, this is bringing everybody down. Why do you keep talking about death? Like, you need a better PR man. I mean, we're, you're the Messiah. We're with you. Why do you keep, you know what Jesus says? Get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things, the th in mind the things of God, but the things of men. He knows why he's there. He knows that the road of cheering leading into the city is going to lead out to shouts of crucify him to his death. I don't think he's weeping for himself, but he's weeping for the people who are missing it. How often do we try to talk some sense into Jesus? Jesus, what are you doing? Let me explain to you how this ought to be going. He knows exactly how it should be going. And he weeps. It's not political or civil peace that he's come to bring. It's peace with God. He will ascend to the throne, but first he has to go to the cross. They want to skip off. That's what the people are missing. I think we miss it too. We want to go right from triumphal entry to seated on the throne, but first the cross. But first the suffering. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, reconciling them both to God in one body through the cross. The incarnation of Jesus, it feels like Christmas outside, the incarnation we celebrate is for the purpose of the crucifixion and the eventual resurrection. You, they all go together. If they're not linked, they're just, they don't make any sense. The reason he came, it's all culminating in this week. And this brings us to the confrontational king. He's paradoxical because he's not what you expect and not what you would want and not what you would choose at first in your own mind, in your own wisdom. He's also confrontational. Where's the first place Jesus goes? Where does he go? Into the city, shouts, praise, joy. Where does he go? He goes to a hotel, right? Puts his feet up for a while, orders some room service, goes to the palace. He goes to the fortress. No. The first place Jesus goes, some of you know, is the temple. He goes right to the temple. Let's read verses 45 to 48. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Now the first time Luke records Jesus in the temple is in Luke chapter 2. Some of you will know this. Jesus was about 12 years old, a boy with his parents, Mary and Joseph, his earthly parents. And they're bringing him there on the bar mitzvahs didn't exist in the same way you think of them, but on his, the season of his becoming a man. And it would have been traditional for his dad, Joseph, to walk him around and show young Jesus, his son, how a, a father of a family prepares the Passover, because they were there at Passover week as well. All the things that must be done to prepare, including how you go to the temple, how you prepare this, the lamb for the family, how you bring it to the priest and they drain the lifeblood out. In fact, this might gross you out a little bit, but some think that the, 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 some Jewish scholars tell us the father would place the knife in the son's hand. They would both hold together the lamb's throat as they would slit the throat and drain the blood and present it there for sacrifice. So it's conceivable that Joseph is doing this with Jesus in Luke chapter 2. 
And then when they go home, they can't find Jesus. It makes me feel better that even Mary and Joseph misplaced a son. We once left our youngest son at, a, at Wheaton Bowl at 2 a.m. on New Year's Eve. So I feel better that they lost him for three days. I lost him for a couple of hours. <laughs> they go back and they find him. Where do they find him? At the arcade? In the market? Where is Jesus? Young Jesus. He's in the temple. He's talking with the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, teachers of the law. And the, the, Joseph and Mary say, why have you treated us like this? And he goes, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house about my father's business? Well, here in Luke 19, in the last week of his life, he's also about his father's business. And he's back in the temple. And when he gets there, he's not throwing out the pagan Romans. He's not throwing out the non-Jewish Gentiles. He comes right to his own people, the Jews, God's people, and starts flipping over tables, driving them out. Now, I was thinking about this this week. We are so quick, I am so quick, to point my finger at the problems in the world with our government, and rightly so these days, with our educational systems, with our, our dysfunctional two-party system, or with our culture, with you know, the, the morally co compromised culture of Hollywood, and justly so sometimes, with social media. But I'm just, it's easy, so easy for us to point our finger out there and say, that's the problem, they're the problem, this is the problem. I want you to see that when God looks at a nation or a people in moral decay and decline, where does he point the finger? At his people, at his people. Jesus comes into the city and goes right to his own, drives them out, calls them out, confronts them. Now, he's done this once before in John chapter 2. Earlier in his adult ministry, he did this where he made a cord, uh, a whip out of cords of his own that he fashioned them together. We think of Jesus as this sort of meek, wandering, homeless guy who said wise things. Maybe, you know, kind of a weak guy. Jesus was a carpenter, worked with his hands all his life, walked everywhere. Made a whip out of cords and drove people out of it. I mean, he was, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. So he's done this before, and here again, Mark, Mark's account of this tells us that he flipped over the tables. You wanna get somebody's attention? Walk up to them when they're in the middle of a meal or an important meeting and just flip the table over. It causes a scene, doesn't it? Just start flipping tables over. These aren't real lightweight folding tables. These would have been fairly heavy pieces of furniture in the temple. Jesus turned them over. It would have been chaos. Why such a reaction? Because the temple is supposed to be the place where people meet with and worship God. The temple was the symbolic presence of God among his people. It's the place you went to meet God. Now there were some God-ordained barriers and things you had to do to remind you that he is holy and we are not. But these money changers and sellers are creating unnecessary barriers to people coming to God. Let me put it this way. God does not like it when his people set up unnecessary barriers to others coming to know him and experience him. God is not happy when we, his people, set up unnecessary barriers that keep others away from him. It's happening in the temple and sometimes it happens in the church today. Sometimes it happens, I wish it wasn't so, but sometimes even in our church. We become blind to certain things, entrenched in our ways. We look at certain people certain ways. When you, how many of you, by show of hands, have been a part of this church for more than a decade? Put your hand up. Okay. You know what? You have huge blind spots. <laughs> I do too. You just become used to it. You don't see this experience the way people who are new see it. You don't see it through their eyes. I, I think 
Jesus is angry in the temple because they've done something unthinkable in the place where you go to experience God. They've set up these false, corrupted scams that are really barriers to people. Your sacrifice isn't good enough. We'll change that money at a rate that's ridiculous. We're extorting money from you. We're selling you, uh, you have to buy our dove, our pigeon, our lamb. Yours isn't good enough. We say around here, Chapel Street Church, a place for where you are. It's my prayer that's not just words, but it's true. That we're not a spiritually elite club. We're a hospital for sinners, or at least we should be. The church, the people of God, is meant to be a bridge, not a barrier to people encountering God. I think that's why Jesus is so angry. I think that's why when he rides in as a king, a paradoxical king, and a confrontational king, he goes right to the temple. Also, interestingly, when he drives out those who are selling the sacrifices, he's also driving out the sacrifices, isn't he? Why? He's now going to be the sacrifice. He is, as John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And lastly, he's the transformational king. Jesus cleanses the temple in Jerusalem when he enters, but in 40 years, in 70 AD, it'll be destroyed. So what's the point of temple cleansing if it's all going to be torn down? Where's the temple for the Christian? Those of you that are Jesus followers, where's the temple today? Where is it? <laughs> First Corinthians chapter six, the apostle Paul says, do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? In Ephesians chapter two, he says, we are being joined together, built together to become a holy temple, a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit, built on Christ Jesus, the chief cornerstone. His people are his temple. Your life is his temple. Do you think Jesus still comes to turn over the tables in his temple today? Do you think he still comes to drive things out of his temple? He absolutely does. He absolute, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, right? If we confess our sins to one another, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 4, perfect love casts out, drives out all fear. I believe that Jesus, if you're his follower, has some things he wants to drive out of your life, overturn in your life. In mine too. In mine too. Have you, had, have you ever had Jesus overturn the tables in your life? You got it all nice and set up your life, you feel like you got, finally got things in order and then something happens and you're like, I didn't plan on this. This is not part of the plan. Can you ever look back and see Christ's hand in it? He's trying to do something in us. Not to destroy you or to shame you, but to liberate you. To bring you back to what he made you to be. Now look back at verse 30 of chapter 19 for a minute. Jesus is telling the two to go in the village. And when you enter there, you'll find a colt on which no one has ever yet sat. That's a curious detail, isn't it? Only Luke includes that. No one's ridden it. No one has sat on it. Why does he include that? Maybe it's just a detail. Luke's a physician, attention to detail. Maybe he's just a detailed guy. But I think there's something else going on here. What happens when you try to get on top of a colt or an animal that no one's ever sat on before and ride it around? Does it go, where to? Does it go that way? My Uncle Jerry, um, by the way, this, this is as an aside. My Uncle Jerry, 79 years old, my mom's brother, Far from God, didn't want anything to do with God. He's in a nursing home and struggling in the last days of his life. And my sisters, my mom and her sister would go to visit him. And he finally said to them, listen, if you guys keep bringing up God, I'm gonna ask you not to come anymore. Just didn't want to hear it. I found out two weeks ago that he prayed to receive Christ. With a chaplain, and he didn't tell anybody what was going on in his own heart. But at 79 years old, with, with less than a couple months to live, he prayed to receive the mercy of King Jesus in his heart. It's amazing. Um, 
Okay, what was I bringing him up for? That's a good reason. But oh yeah, he, he was a rancher <laughs> in Montana, and he raised horses. Uh, and and I, when I was a kid, I was, when I was 12 years old, I went out to spend a summer working on his ranch. And I learned to ride and saddle a horse and all that sort of thing, you know. And, and uh, I was, he told me to go up to the horse, and I said, pick out one of the horses on the left side, put his bridle on and lead it out. So I did that. He goes, oh, no, not that one. That one's not broken yet. I don't know what that means. To me, I didn't understand. Some of you will know this. Apparently, you have to break an animal. You have to get it used to this feel of the saddle, the feel of the bit, the feel of the bridle, the feel of weight, and they don't like it. They buck and they kick, and it's dangerous for a young kid to have an unbroken horse. Jesus rides an unbroken animal through a cheering crowd. See, Charles Spurgeon says about it, in the midst of this excited throng, an unbroken animal remains totally calm under the hands of the one who also calmed the sea. When Jesus is in the saddle of your life, holding the reins of your life, he doesn't break you, he liberates you. He's the only one who can. He's the true king that your heart longs for. C.S. Lewis in one of his essays called Present Concerns writes this, where men are forbidden to honor a king they will honor millionaires, athletes, film stars instead. That was written in 1947. Even famous prostitutes or gangsters. For spiritual nature, like bodily nature, must be served. Deny it food, and it will gobble poison. Do you hear what he's saying? You're made for the king. You're going to have a king. It can be the right one who, when he has the reins of your life, liberates you, or the wrong one who breaks you and ultimately destroys you. I think there's something profound happening here in this cult of, that no one's ever yet ridden on. That when the king sits on the cult, calm seas. Notice also this place when Jesus is told by the Pharisees, hey, tell your disciples to shut up. Stop saying this. Stop t- talking about you as if you're the king. You're not the king. Jesus has an answer. Do you know what he says? He says, I tell you, if they're quiet, what's going to happen? The stones will cry out. What is that about? Is that just Bible speak for they have to? I think he's referring back to Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 55, verse 12. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now you might think, oh, Isaiah's being just poetic there. Maybe. Psalm 96, verses 12 to 13. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to rule the earth, judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. When the king comes, things change. What that means is, when you read through Genesis chapter three and then read Romans chapter eight, you get a picture of what went wrong, how we rejected our king, and we've been living in rebellion against the true king. And nothing in your life, or my life, or this world, is as it's supposed to be. But when the king comes, things begin to be put right. You know the story of Narnia? Lewis's Narnia stories? What's the phrase that all the creatures, Mr. Beaver, beginning with Mr. Beaver, and all the creatures of Narnia use about Aslan the lion? He's on the move again. Do you remember this? Am I the only nerd in here? He's on the move. And because he's on the move, what happens? The trees of Narnia actually sing. Some animals who've been mute begin to speak again. Things go back to how they're meant to be. I think we're getting little hints here in Luke 19 of the consummation of the kingdom when the wolf and the lamb will lie down together. And what this means is if when the king comes, rocks sing, trees dance, what will you do? What will you and I do when the king comes? If stones can cry out and sing, what were we made for? 
I think when the king comes, we're told when the king comes here and we surrender our lives to him and we take him as he, on his agenda, on his terms, not on ours, trying to make him our Messiah the way we want him to be. He doesn't break you like we break a horse. He liberates you. He's the only one in the universe that can control your life without destroying your life. You give control of your life to anyone or anything else, it will be your undoing. But when you give it to the king, he sets you free. I think that's what Palm Sunday is about. The king has come. The road that leads into the city with praise will lead out again with tears, but the road doesn't end there because there's an empty tomb at the end of that road. But you have to come back next week to hear that part of the story. Let's bow together in prayer. Father God, there's more in this passage than we could possibly plumb the depths of in one sermon. But we acknowledge before you right now that you're king. You're our king. You're our rightful ruler. You made us in your image and you have rightful claim over our lives. And we have confessed to you that we rebel against your reign and your rule. We resist it. We chafe under it. Forgive us for that. Speak by your Holy Spirit to our minds and hearts that we might be the kind of people you've created us to be. Set free, singing your praise without fear or concern or worry about how we might sound or how we might look. Help us as your people in this world to be a bridge, not a barrier to those who want to know you. Father, God, of all times in history, perhaps now more than ever, our world is in desperate need of people who bring our whole lives under your control under your reign. We thank you that you're the king and you're our king, the risen king, Lord Jesus. Amen.